Thanks for joining us for another For Investors by Investors Long Beach podcast. As always, we're proud to be your all education real estate resource without any kind of sales pitch. If you'd like to attend one of our meetings in person, we meet on the last Thursday of the month at the Grand in Long Beach, California. You can RSVP on forinvestorsbyinvestors.com forward slash Long Beach. To find more investment resources such as blogs and podcasts and content from other Phoebe groups, you can go to forinvestorsbyinvestors.com and search our entire library. Now, on to the podcast. There we go. We are live. Uh, so this is For Investors by Investors Long Beach, and my name is Matthew Owens. Tonight we are talking about self-directed retirement accounts. Uh, I am a CPA and a full-time real estate investor, and uh, I flip about five to ten houses a month right now out of state. I've been doing it for about ten years. Uh, we flipped over 600 houses. We also do a lot of value-add multifamilies. Uh, we lend capital out to other flippers. We have a short-term rental business. We raise capital for different syndicated investments and things like that. And then we run this this group, this nonprofit organization, where we teach financial education and real estate education without a sales pitch involved. And we bring in high quality speakers like Karen here, uh, the owner of Udirect IRA Services, and um, she's a wealth of knowledge. We've done a ton of different classes and webinars together, and um, probably one of the, the the top experts in the field when it comes to self directed retirement accounts. And I, I have to say, her knowledge base, and I, I got to give her thanks for 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 the amount of knowledge she's bestowed on me over the years on this and staying up on the industry and things that changes in the industry. Um, Karin, can you tell us a little bit about like, about your background and um, how you got started in self-directed IRAs? So I was born. Accounts? You want me to go? Or no? <laughs> okay. We will speed it up a little. Okay. So I, um, I guess I was a radio announcer for 17 years. So that's what I did. And so then I made, I'll do it. Let me do it. Yes. Okay. Are we on? Light rock. Let's talk. I love it. <laughs> and, and then I made the logical transition into real estate, right? Don't we all? And uh, then uh, did a little bit, you know, uh, what I was a realtor, property manager, um, got into mortgage loan servicing for eight years, uh, then got into mortgage loan origination. And then, of course, as we all know, the bottom fell out of the mortgage market. And I was looking for a job, and I got a job at a self-directed IRA company. And I did that for a couple of years and did pretty well. And I thought, well, I'll just do this myself. So I did. So with Matt's help, Matt was there with me day one. You know, we're, we're buddies and hang, hanging out. And um, uh, so that was 2009, and like September 1st, around 2009. It's been like almost nine years. Can you believe that? I know. <laughs> Crazy. And so in that time, uh, the company's really grown, and uh, I also, I sit on the board of directors for the Retirement Industry Trust Association. We just had our meeting in Washington, D.C. Just got back from it last night, um, which is great, because I've got, you guys will hear all the fresh information. Not a lot of changes in our industry from year to year, but a couple things to talk about. So that takes me through my, my career. There it is. Great. And, um, and right now with Udirect IRA services, how do, you, how do you help clients? Can you talk about what a self-directed IRA is and, sure. um, and, and how it works compared to other IRAs in 401ks? Right. There's so much misunderstanding about what a self-directed IRA is. And it's not just from investors, but it's from uh, people who are like uh, bankers and uh, uh, CPAs, attorneys, a lot of people misunderstand what this is. Regulators <laughs> misunderstand what a self-directed IRA is. So an IRA is an IRA. It's a way to save for retirement. It's an individual retirement arrangement. Um, Gerald Ford signed the ERISA laws into effect in 74. They went to effect in 75. So that's 43 years. I mean, longer than some of you have even been alive, right? You know, so it's been a long time. Been, they've been around a long time. So that's what it is. A self-directed IRA lets you invest in what's called alternative assets, which is not the stock market, so non-correlated assets. So just know an IRA is an IRA. A self-directed IRA, they're just buckets that you're going to put assets in. That's what IRAs are. And in a self-directed IRA, you can invest outside the stock market into alternative assets. They're called like notes, like real estate. You can wholesale. Um, you can do fix and flip, multifamily, raw land, whatever you want. Okay. Okay. Great. And you know, from my perspective, I've used the self-directed IRA or four hundred one k or self-directed retirement accounts in, in a number of ways for myself. And so, some a lot, a lot of the things that people utilize them for are one tax mitigation, right? Going through and contributing as much as you can to these things to mitigate your current tax situation, which is huge. But then at the same time. 
Um, also being able to utilize it for your own investing to create your own cash flow streams, but also utilizing other people's retirement accounts for your own investing and utilizing it as a tool to be able to make them a return and yourself a tool once you understand how to protect those investors. If you don't understand how to protect those investors and how the IRAs work in the first place, you're going to get yourself into trouble by doing the wrong things and, and possibly losing your investor's capital. And that's the worst thing you can do because you they're trading their time for these these types of um, uh, for their capital, so um, so you know going through this, you want to be able to make sure that you protect those investors first when you're doing it. But um, it can be hugely powerful in the long run when you're investing to um, to actually utilize this as a base. Because how, how much money is in retirement accounts right now? Well, we just found out that it's it's uh, twenty seven trillion, close to twenty eight trillion dollars in America wow. in, in retirement wow. in, in all IRAs combined. And just in, uh, or I mean, all retirement accounts combined, just in IRAs, just got this figure this week, uh, $8.9 trillion just in IRAs. And when you and I first, you know, first started our businesses, which was at the same time, that number was about three uh, to four trillion, and so it's really increased. So it's As a lot of people have trillion, left their jobs, yeah. Three or four trillion dollars in then, IRA. Okay. That was then, now it's 8.9. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. So, so this is untapped money, and I can tell you that. 90% of the people out there do not know what to do with their money. Okay, so if you become a specialist in understanding what to do and how to protect their money, you can kill it. You can just absolutely kill it. But you have to, you know, have that respect for that money first, of course. And so, you know, speaking of that, you know, a lot of people try to go into IRAs and re retirement accounts, but, you know, don't have time, you know, don't have that experience and knowing what to do with their money because they've so long they've been in the check the box, I want risky, mid-risk or low-risk type mentality with a traditional company <laughs> like Fidelity or something like that. And all of a sudden, now they're responsible for their own investments. It's not a check the box kind of thing. Right. This is this is something you're active in. Can you talk about a little bit about some of the some of the intricacies about how a normal IRA works and mm -hmm. how someone goes about investing their money into a investment in the first place? Sure. An IRA? Sure. Right. I, I will. And I'll just say, you know, when you've got a financial advisor and they've got a license like a Series 63 or a 7 or something, they're they're there. They're going to hold your hand the whole way through it. Then they're going to get paid on your assets under management and they're licensed to sell you securities, you know, stock market correlated assets. And so you're going to get a different kind of a service because, frankly, they're licensed to do it. With self-directed IRA companies, we're either a custodian or an administrator. We're not advisors. So we're not here to tell you what to invest in, what's a good or bad investment, how, what, how much you should invest, or what asset you should pick. So we don't do that, and I think that's a big that's a big misunderstanding. Right, um, you're pretty much on your own. You you are you 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 are the one right. that is going out and investing your own money. It's not the custodians that are right. doing it for you like previously, right? That's exactly right. And yeah, and, and uh, so so you're gonna you're gonna choose your own asset class, which is great. You've got all this freedom, but of course with freedom comes responsibility. So some of the responsibility is to do your due diligence on not not just uh, well, it's you know, start off with the asset that you're gonna invest in. Do a lot of homework about it. I, it's that's a, a great conversation to have. But once you and we can maybe talk about it later a little more in depth. But the way you get an asset into a self-directed IRA, really it's a three-step process. You open an account by filling out some paperwork. You fund the account either by making a contribution where you check with your CPA and you say, hey, how much can I contribute? It'll be based on your income and your age and also your account type, but you, you find out how much you can contribute. You could do an IRA to IRA transfer where you uh, could maybe it's just another IRA somewhere. And then you would use our paperwork fill it out. Or you can do a rollover. You said you had a lot of 401ks. So that's called a rollover. So you don't come to us and fill out our paperwork. You go to your plan administrator, fill out their paperwork after you've opened an account, and they will move, they'll roll over that money uh, into an IRA. So if it's like a 457, a 403B, 401k, an employer plan, those are rollovers. So those, those are the three ways you put money in. And then you invest. So you choose your asset. And the way you choose your asset is by just being here. You know, how many different asset classes did we hear about? Just mentioned right here, you know, um, like notes, for example. Notes are, are real popular. And, and uh, so say you, you know, whatever you want to, you choose something like that. And then you, you found the asset. You decided what you want to do. You made that decision. So then you give us a direction letter, which tells us, you know, it's kind of sort of like a check where it's got your name and how much. And you sign it. You give us the supporting documentation, which is the, maybe if it's a note or deed of trust, maybe it's an offer to purchase, 
Uh, maybe it's uh, a private placement memorandum. It could be a lot of different things. Uh, you give us that supporting documentation. We review it, fund it, and then all the proceeds go back in the IRA. If there are any expenses associated with that asset, they're paid for by the IRA. Okay, that, great. In a nutshell. Okay. So, so my direction letter to yes. say, hey, fund my money here, legal paperwork that goes with it. Right. And then you say, okay, great, invest. All the paperwork is, as long as that paperwork is put together correctly. Right. You know, and, and so um, in the beginning, you know, I didn't know what I was doing and we're submitting paperwork wrong and things like that. Well, Every time I you're creative. Back, you know, <laughs> you're, you're like, hey, I gotta, I gotta make sure I get my stuff right, which is yeah. great. Now, now, don't get me wrong, IRA custodians don't have a fiduciary responsibility necessarily here um, at all with regard to your paperwork or your legal documentation or even helping you to tell you if it's a risky or not risky investment. They are not here for that. Mm -hmm. They are here as a administrator to come in and help you say, I want to put my money here to here. They are holding the account for you. They are not going through and saying, here's the due diligence that you should be doing on this investment in itself. They are not going through and giving the paperwork involved. Well, you know what it's saying. like? It's like escrow when you buy a house. When you go to escrow, they're not telling you what house to buy. You know, they're not telling you how to write it off on your income taxes. Um, escrow isn't telling you, well, I, I wouldn't, I do. The, I get the other house next door. They're not going to give you that kind of advice. They're just going to administrate the deal and get it from here to there and move the paperwork. And, and that's what we do. That's the service we provide. Okay. And, um, and with regard to, you know, the different investment types, okay, let's talk about some of the most common ones that, that we see out there, which let's start with like a promissory note, okay? Sure. So what that is is where someone is actually coming in and you're, you're loaning money from your IRA, you know, probably secured against the property or something along those lines. Um, and um, and all the interest is coming right back into your IRA tax-free. So any investment that you have, all the income comes back into your IRA or tax-deferred or if it's a Roth, tax-free in the long term. Um, but um, so what typical documentation go that you normally see come with a promissory note um, when it gets submitted to you? What's the typical? I'm not saying what is legally right here. Not <laughs> yeah, we're not giving legal or tax advice. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you talk about this because, you know, I said I just came back from the conference and we had this really, uh, for, you know, for us funny conversation about the kinds of notes that we see, you know, napkin notes that are written down and they don't have any like, a term or, or the things that people want to self-direct. So understand that Yes, you get to invest in the assets that you know, but the but the administrator, the, the custodian or administrator gets to say what's administratively feasible, like what we will and won't take. Right. So some notes that we won't take, we want to see that a note uh, has a principal amount, an interest, uh, amount of interest, you know, like, and, and you can't change like four different kinds of interest, you know, when, you know it has to be understandable. Um, so in, principal, interest, a, a duration, a maturity date, these basic elements of a note, and a lot of times we'll get notes that it doesn't have any of those things. So you have to go back and no, make it, it has to have all the elements of a note. And if it's secured, we need to see the security instrument as well. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of funny when you say that because you know how bad people are with their, their financial situation and their checkbook and things like that. Think about people trying to do self-made legal documents because this happens a lot. <laughs> it you know, does, nobody yeah. wants to pay the attorney a couple thousand dollars to go write a proper legal documentation document mm -hmm. or review it and things like that. And so the <laughs> card's getting the brunt of this stuff, you know, yeah. what happens. Yeah. And so uh, it's important to understand, um, you know, what paperwork is submitted with this stuff. Like, you know, when you're doing a prom when you're doing a promissory note, you're typically using, a pro you know, um, the actual promissory note governs the document or governs the actual contract involved, and then you have a deed of trust which secures your money against that property. You can also have some other things like an assignment of rents and leases, which uh, gets recorded so that you can actually go and collect rents directly if you don't get paid. There's a lot of different documentation that goes into just a promissory. Now, you can also buy houses inside your retirement account, right? Oh, so yeah. um, how, does, how does that typically work? Well, it's the same process, you know, but, but when you're buying a house um, using a self-directed IRA, I think one of the things you need to remember is, say, for example, you're partnering with somebody on a house, and you, because a lot of times your IRA won't have 100% of the home value. So if there's, say, two people investing, that the, whatever your pro rata split is, it starts from the beginning. It starts from the earnest money. It goes on to closing costs. And then now you've closed. Now you need a new roof. So then you, you each pay your pro rata share of whatever, whatever it happens. And similarly, you get the pro rata share of rent back. And it's always split pro rata like that. So when you've got a situation where you're partnering with somebody with your IRA, 
That means your renters have to literally write two checks, one to you and one to the other investment partner. And that can get cumbersome. So having a property manager can be very helpful because Thank you. you're welcome. It was, <laughs> I always say that, but it's a good shameless plug for right now. But, uh, but the reason that you want a property manager is because then your tenants can just write one check to the property manager. They can withhold a, like a, a fund, you know, in, to make, to take care of repairs. Cause you know how things happen. It'll be Saturday morning, three o'clock and you get up to get some water and then your garbage disposal doesn't work. So you need someone to fix it. Well, then the property manager can come take care of that with the, with the fund they have. So yeah. So, so the, just the property managers can be a self-directed IRA's best friend because you have to keep things arm's length. Yeah, and, and what about when you know it's not a partnership type deal and you want to borrow money on the property? Can you? Yeah, that you can, that? and there's so many misconceptions about this. Okay. Your self-directed IRA can borrow money, yes, but you know I come from the lending background and mortgage and residential lending, so I was really surprised when I found that a lender would make a loan to an IRA account. You know, it's not to you, the person. It's not about your FICO score. It's not about how much money you have in savings or how long you've worked at your job. You know, it's about the property. It's about its location and condition, but it's mostly about um, the, the the rental income. So a lot of times these non-recourse lenders that want to see a rental agreement before you close. They want to see the cash flow. And with a lot of self, a lot of these uh, non-recourse lenders, they want, they want you to have more skin in the game. So it's not going to be like a 5% uh, down or anything like this. It'll it'll be where your IRA will come up with 50, 60 percent, and then the loan will cover the rest. So that's that's typical. But then it goes down to the next level is when your IRA receives income because of borrowed money. The money you receive because of borrowed money is taxable. So you know uh, Matt can elaborate on this, but it's called UDFI, unrelated debt financed income tax. Doesn't mean it has to kill your deal. I mean, the rate's pretty high. It's the same as a trust rate, which I think got lowered to thirty-eight percent, something like that, or lower. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, lower. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it can be pretty hefty. But check with your tax advisor, and always begin with the end in mind. You know, pencil things out. Like here, are my acquisition costs, my closing costs. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm going to borrow thirty percent. So I'm going to get a thousand dollar rent check. So every month, three hundred dollars is going to be taxable and. So that's going to be this right. You're going to factor everything out before you even enter the deal and do your homework so you can say, hey, is this a great deal? Because sometimes borrowing money and, and paying the uh, UDFI tax, you can still have the best deal you ever had. Right. And I think I think it's important to, to understand, you know, the, the portion that you borrow, You if you buy a property and you borrow money, so you borrow 70% of it or 60% of it or something like that, then 60% is taxable, right? But you get 60% of the depreciation benefits you would have gotten as well that can go against that other that, that percentage too. So you really pay, it's still got some tax sheltering components of it on a, on a single family home or a multifamily or any kind of property. Um, and keep in mind too, um, when, when you actually borrow funds inside of a 401k versus yes. an IRA, you don't have that UDFI That's tax, right. 401k, solo 401ks, really did you say you have one? Your solo 401k does not pay UDFI tax. Yeah, which is really interesting. So just to get, give you guys an example of uh, a deal that I did, um, I inside my 401k, I did a $500,000 loan on a property in North Carolina at 12% in a point. And then I, um, and that was at 65% of the value of that property. And then I borrowed 450000 of it uh, at an 8% rate. And that was at 51% of the value of the property. And um, and I was able to go through and make on my 50000 I'm making like a 34% return on my money. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's really interesting when you start to actually go through and structure deals like this. Now, don't get me wrong. I know every piece of the paperwork involved and how to protect that investor involved. I also go through and lend, you know, to self-directed IRAs. So you investors in the room that are looking to, you know, find new ways of liquidating properties and things like that, I self I seller finance properties, usually with 35, 40% down on those deals, and I give my investors a 15-year fully amortized loan um, in those things so that by, when they retire, um, it is, um, it's a fully cash flow asset in there so they can live off of those things. So think about these types of things as you're investing in real estate in different ways, how you could utilize the self-directed IRAs to, to make money, but at the same time provide a really good product to different people. And do I care that it's non-recourse? Because I can't go after that IRA owner. They can't legally uh, qualify and, and be on the hook for these loans. It has to be non-recourse for them. And so I'm looking at the property only, which is why most of these lenders make you put down 
forty percent or more or something like that on the deals because they can't go after you for any deficiency. They want to make sure that there's enough skin in the game to make that type of deal work because they're looking at it as an asset-based loan only for their protection. So that's you know really really key when you guys are investing in different different uh, strategies to understand what the capabilities are and also. What you know, understanding these tax consequences for your investors when you're raising money for them to be able to explain those things to them, but also at the same time say go talk to a tax advisor, you know, because you don't want to take the liability on associated with it. Um, uh, giving advice when you shouldn't yet, you know. Um, but those those types of things are very very key, and you can make a killing. So those high yielding deals where you have an outside operator doing all the work if you're passive or something like that. You know, they're, they're great strategies for self-directed retirement accounts. It's a, a very, very big thing that you can do um, to really supercharge those things. And if you can get it into a self-directed Roth 401k or something like that, it can be absolutely amazing. Um, let's talk about some of the some of the due diligence and things like that that some of the people you see doing on these deals. So like on a house... Um, based on what you're saying, I know you're not telling people how to do the due diligence right. on this, but what are some of the things you see people doing on the due diligence side when they're trying to buy a house? Well, um, I think the basics, we see people, you know, doing a title report, making sure the seller can actually, has the right to sell the house. <laughs> you know, that's good. And, and, and checking out the terms, but also checking out the condition of the house, getting inspectors and things like that. And the IRA would pay that expense. And so, so everything you normally do everything. when you're trying to buy a house, you want to do this. So keep in mind, guys, you're not checking the box anymore. You're actually going through and doing the homework on those deals. Yeah. Making sure when you invest in a house that it has the good bones, it has the good systems, you're not going to lose your money. Because what happens if you run out of money in your IRA? Um, what, what do you what do you have to do? Yeah. Right. Well, if you, if your IRA runs out of money, because all expenses have to be paid for by the IRA, there are six things you can do. You know, you can you can uh, make a contribution to make up for the shortfall. You can um, sell another asset in your self directed IRA and, and then use that cash to make up for it, or transfer money from another uh, account and bring it in. You you could uh, partner with somebody. Your IRA could take a loan. Um, and if all else fails, your IRA could just sell the asset if you, if you just can't come up with the money, if the asset's too expense intensive, okay. and, just, uh, and, and just sell the asset. You could do that too. And, and that, that, all that stuff is important, I think, to understand is how do you get yourself out of a situation if all of a sudden your rehab is way higher than you think it was on a house or something like that. Um, you know, you want to be able to make sure you can fund that account in one way, shape, or form or bring in a partner or something like that to do that. So really important. Now let's, let's talk about... Um, one of the other fun taxes that go into the IRA. <laughs> fun taxes, yeah. said the CPA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the unrelated debt, or no, that's the, that's the debt one, the, the, the business one. The, yeah. um, UBIT. UBIT, there we go. Yeah. Unrelated yeah. business income tax. So what is that and how do you, uh, what, what kind of, uh, I, I guess. Like when does it show up? What, yeah, when, when does it show up? What does it matter? Right, well, it's when your IRA invests in an active business. So when I first started in this industry, there were a lot of homes to flip, and so there are a lot of flippers in the audience. And if your, your IRA can flip, that's fine, and you know, buy a house, fix it up, and sell it. Uh, but then it can also be viewed as running an active, active business. So if you're a professional flipper, and that's how you make your income outside the IRA, and you flip even one property, it, it might... Um, be, you know, uh, el sub subject, I should say, subject to uh, UBIT tax. But with the IRS, it's always, it depends. Um, but typically, as long as your IRA is, is for investment purposes only, and it's not, you're not running a business in the IRA, you flip, you know, like, what they say, three a year, but there's, the IRS doesn't give us a number. Right, this is just different attorneys and CPAs saying, look, this is what the guidance yeah. we've gotten over time, and it's not set in stone. Every it's so true. IRS agent could Different. And and there's one young woman who uh, who had who was going to appeal something uh, because the IRS said that she flipped something like oh what was it 25 houses in her IRA in one year like good for her right wow. and they said she, she, she's a flipper and that's what that was her job and so she owed this UBIT tax but she was claiming that she didn't so she appealed it and they said that seven of the houses. Um, she only had to pay UBIT tax on seven of the houses, and the other 18 went tax-free. Why? You know, it depends. It's because that, that was the judgment that they made, so it had to do with the people she was talking to and so forth. So anyway, there's, the IRS doesn't give us a lot of guidance on how many houses you can flip. But there, another, another time I was speaking last week, and somebody came up to me and says, you know, I invested in a private placement, and you didn't tell me that, <laughs> that I was going to owe UBIT tax. It's like, well... 
Okay, so it's, you, we need to do your due diligence, and you, if you're going to invest in a private placement, you want to read the um, subscription agreement, you want to read the operating agreement, are, is, are they running an active business, what are they doing? Also, if the private placement takes on debt, you could pay UDFI, and that'll, be, that'll flow through on the K-1, and it'll show that it's due. So those are sometimes, especially with the private place, but people don't really realize, well, wait a minute, I'm investing passively in someone else's deal. Why do I owe tax? And it's because it, it flows through. Right. It's the, the debt piece flows through on that mm-hmm. question here. If, um, if, if you make your account one of those check, checkbook um, a software mm-hmm. errors, does that automatically say that it's a business and then that you make sure that they do it? No, not, not at all. So th- let's talk about the IRA-owned LLC. So it's called the checkbook IRA, which is a terrible name because there's nothing – like the IRS doesn't have a checkbook IRA. It's not in the IRS tax code at all. It's just like a jargon kind of a name. But it really is an IRA-owned LLC. So it was uh, Swanson v. Commissioner in 1996 that started all this. But your IRA is, is funded, has money, buys 100% of the initial units of a special purpose LLC, not – not like the kind that you would open to run a business. It's not that kind of LLC. It's special purpose. And usually a single member LLC is typically passed through. Um, you know, Matt can back me up on that. But a passed through entity where it's disregarded for tax purposes, most of these single member LLCs are. So it's not that kind of an LLC. But it, everything you do within that, that IRA owned LLC is just as though your IRA were doing it. All the same rules apply. So when your IRA has this IRA owned LLC, it's not an active business. And that's what's kind of cool about the self-directed, you know, uh, IRA LLC is, you know, basically what's happening is your IRA is purchasing shares of the LLC and the funds are placed inside the LLC with the purchase. The IRA, yeah. Yeah, the IRA funds are put into the LLC bank account. Now Mm -hmm. you have checkbook control, you can be the manager of that LLC, and you can cut checks, uh, you know, directly for investments. Now that doesn't mean that you're any better of an investor in that case. You need to be able to still do your due diligence, still do your homework on those deals, just, and, and realize that now, when there's nobody to submit paperwork to in that case, to be able to say, hey, you didn't get that signature, this is not a right legal document here, You know, which most custodians will put a kind of a stopping point and say, Hey, make sure you have get me all the documentation here. Um, now, with you have your now you have complete control, so all the responsibility is on you in this case. Mm-hmm. It's still on you with the IRA custodian, but in some cases, it's like when you go to a, a really good private money lender and they find a bad deal for it. you. You can find a deal and it's a bad deal. They'll tell you we're not going to fund this, and you shouldn't flip this either. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the same type of mentality. There's no real liability there. There's mm-hmm. no uh, you know reason that they should you know necessarily. There's no legality telling them that they they have to tell you not to do this or anything like that, but sometimes the IRA custodian will say no. Well, we don't want you to have a bad experience, but but we can't advise. So sometimes, like, um, if we see that there's, if if we can see that it's a bad deal or we've done a, a, you know, we just took a look, because as a business, do we want to custody this asset? That's a question we're asking ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if it's dangerous and or if it can lead to litigation, then that's not a good business decision. So if we can see that that maybe uh, the person you're investing with was incarcerated, (laughs) you know, then we might say this asset's not administratively feasible, and you'll say, "Well, why?" Well, we can't tell you the guy was in jail because that could be slander, libel, or yeah. you know, so forth. We can just say, "Well, it's an asset we choose not to custody." So there, it, that's not always what it means. Uh, can be, but that could be one of the meanings of yeah, not administratively feasible. There's some other intricacies and issues sometimes when you're dealing with different types of transactions as well. Um, mm-hmm. For example, joint ventures. I know we <laughs> right, this, we went through this, we, didn't we? We had this discussion already, right? Where yeah. basically, a lot of times, you know, um, and, and tell me if I'm wrong or not, sure. where, you know, um, the, the stance typically or can be that, hey, you know, who's going to sign and review this joint venture? Is it who's going to actually sign for this? Can you talk about um, the, the joint venture structure and why that's kind of like yeah, a, a little bit. or tough to get done sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Well, a joint venture isn't something you can sell, so it's not an asset. Okay. So you're not going to buy someone's joint venture. Right, you, you, so it's not an asset, and your IRA is for investment purposes only. Your IRA needs to invest in an asset. Well, a joint venture is not an asset. So there you go. Okay, perfect. So, and, and I think that's important to understand. Question? Here. Yeah, um, I read on Bigger Pockets that uh, you're not able to use your IRA to invest in a property that you own, that's but you true. can invest in. So, so I'm wondering yeah. if I own a corporation, could my IRA invest in a corporation that I own, or is that also disqualified? 
You know, investors are creative people, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we're always looking for a way to make a deal work. Right, right. Right. But the IRS... This LLC made me think of it. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, wait, maybe I, if I have the IRA own an LLC and then that invests in the corporation... Yeah. So not the first one. Okay. Yeah, the, <laughs> I, they already thought about this. They, have, In fact, they have a rule. It's called the indirect rule. So if you mm. can't do something directly, you can't do it indirectly. So no. And they're, they're, gonna, they're just going to see right through the corporate veil. It's you. You know, whatever. So And you also can't have your IRA send the money to your LLC and then gives it to you and then puts it in your uh, checking account and then you put it in his C-Corp and then it comes back to you. I mean, there's a paper trail, the indirect trail. If you can't do it directly, you can't do it indirectly. And I, I think that leads to the topic, which is which is the prohibited transactions or the mm-hmm. prohibited parties that you okay. can't do yeah. business mm-hmm. with. Can you talk about mm-hmm. that a little bit? Yeah, pretty pretty easily. It's your it's lineal ascendants and descendants is the way it's written. And if you are a, real, a rule book kind of person, it's um, IRC, Internal Revenue Code 4975, has all these prohibited transactions in there. That's where it's written. But it's your parents and grandparents and their spouses, you and your spouse, uh, your children and your grandchildren are, prohi- are disallowed people. So your IRA doesn't do business directly with these people. But also a 50% business partner. Uh, and there can be other people that are, are disallowed, like anyone offering services to the plan. So if you had an, an IRA with us and, and I had a condo and you wanted your IRA to buy my condo, well, I would be offering services to the plan. So your IRA couldn't buy uh, my condo, you know, that's because I'm offering services, right? Some, like a realtor may be offering services or an attorney. So there are certain people that, that are disallowed besides just your family, ascendants and descendants. But the people who are allowed, it's not just, you can't say it's not family because your brothers and sisters and your nieces and nephews and your uncles and aunts, they're fine. So your IRA could, for example, buy a house and your uncle could live there, but not your dad. You know, your IRA can make a loan to your niece to go to college, but not your own son or your daughter. That's that's a prohibited but transaction. But you could go through and give the loan to your niece to go to college, and then have the uncle go through and get <laughs> to go to college. And might, you're, you're getting some Love it. benefit out of that, possibly. That's so true too. Like with in laws, yeah, in laws are a gray area too. Well, what about your father in law? You know, but so then your IRA gives your. It makes a loan to your father-in-law for, for, for 20 grand, and then for Christmas you're driving a brand new car. You know? <laughs> so, so you gotta be you gotta watch it. So it, you've got to be able to sit in front of an IRS auditor with a straight face and say, I received no personal benefit from this transaction. That's I don't know that that's the, the right um, example, given that you know we don't want to ever pay the IRS auditors anything. We could probably all sit in front of the IRS auditor and say, "No, I didn't do anything wrong." Uh-huh. So. Well, they probably have the. They're probably coming to you because they see something. I'll tell you yeah, what, though, yeah. I've been doing this for ten years, eleven years now, and I've never I only heard of a handful of audits where people are genuinely audited um, and and have a prohibited transactions. But a lot of times, people will get their accounts dispersed because they. Uh, what is it called? They take constructive use of their IRA. So they'll take, the, maybe their IRA has a rental property and they take the rent from the IRA, put it in their own like mm. pocket. And then we had this one guy do this and he says, oh, but I'm writing off the rent on my income taxes. It's like, ah, no, you just blew the veil. There needs to be a custodian between, or a third party between you and your money. So if you pierce that veil by taking personal use of the money, it disallows your entire account. Mm. Um, so that there, we've seen that happen before. Yeah, so you want to make sure you follow the rules. Or another woman took a oh, real quick, took her IRA, her, her rent money from her IRA, and put it in her Charles Schwab IRA over here. And she says, well, I put it in an IRA, but that, no, that was cons- taking constructive use of her IRA. It needs to go back into the account that owns the asset. So anytime you touch the money, yeah. you have personally you have problems, unless you're right. borrowing from a 401k or something like that that is legit under that 401k plan. Sure, right. 401k is a you can't borrow from an IRA, but a 401k lets you borrow. Um, I think he had a question, and we'll get to you. I was just going to say, so you're more than an escrow company. You're well, we're not an escrow company. Right, yeah, you're yeah. Not acting like an escrow Correct. company. It's not just an initial transaction. You're custodian yes. the money and they giving advice, not yes. advice. Yeah. Um, you don't give any tax advice. But we give you advice about your, about your account. And, you know, we were talking right. about the solo. There's so many rules. They're way beyond me. I need someone to... Right, and to talk to, well, we were talking about the IRA-owned LLC, and that brings up a really good point. I could tell you a little story. I was speaking at a Bruce Norris brunch, and I'd been, uh, so a lot of people were there, and uh, I had been speaking earlier in the week to this couple, and, and he had an IRA-owned LLC, and she had an IRA-owned LLC, which is kind of the way to do it if you're husband and wife. Having uh, separate LLCs is a nice way to, to do it for lots of reasons. And they had this perfect deal. They're so excited. They're telling me about Barstow. They've got this um, property, they found this commercial property, and what they were going to do and how great it was. And we talked for an hour, and, at the, and it's always at the end, because that's what I always want to hear about the deal. Tell me about the deal. 
at the end of this hour-long conversation, they go, oh yeah, and we own the property next door. Well, it wasn't immediately obvious to them, but Matt's laughing, why that's a prohibited transaction. You're real estate investors, what do you think? Well, I'll tell you. If, if you own, you know, you own this house, and somebody comes and buys the house next door and improves it or maybe right. pays more for it, what happens to the value of your property? Right. right, and you just got personal benefit from your yeah. IRA-owned asset. Even if they pay less, but maybe they, they, they put in a road, now you've got access, or they improve it and it benefits you personally, that's a prohibited transaction. So we had a, so we had a chat about it. That was really a, a kind of a mind blower for them. But that's what happens when you've got... The IRA-owned LLC is a tool, and you need to use it very, very wisely. Make sure you know what you're doing. It's no joke. And maybe when the regulators have a little more time to do these things, they're low-hanging fruit for um, for auditors. And a couple years ago, as you know, being a CPA, a couple years ago, they changed the 5498, which is where we report uh, account value, and they changed the 1099, where we report distributions, to include these boxes. So it used to be the IRS had no idea what kind of asset was in the account. Now we're telling them. It's an LLC, it's precious metals, they've got a house, they've got a private placement. There's a code and we have to tell them what kind of assets. So they decide to go shopping and they, hey, we need some revenue, which you know the government's always looking for revenue. Let's go audit a whole bunch of IRA owned LLCs and see if they're, being, if they're performing correctly. Um, you wanna make sure yours is. So if you have an IRA owned LLC, it doesn't mean we won't talk to you. Of course we will, call us into, like this couple, they had their IRA owned LLCs. They came and talked to me, hey, what do you think? And I said, well, I think, it sounds prohibited to me, but here's the phone number for a couple of attorneys where you can discuss it with them. But it, you know, since we don't give legal advice, but if you get personal benefit, it's it's disallowed. Can can non prohibited parties from each other can their IRAs do business together? Sure. So like like um, you and your uncle want to go and and buy a house together. So your uncle is using his cash and you're using your IRA absolutely all day long. What about you and your parents' That's IRAs? Right. Yeah, actually you can, and, and there's a, like a loophole. As long as you don't own that asset or have any ownership interest in it to begin with, if you fund concurrently, so if you both you know uh, are on title when it records at the same time, you can invest or note you know you and the other person it records on title at the same time. Um, then, then yeah, you can do that. And, and typically in that kind of a situation, um, is it does it matter when um, you know if, if if you have two IRAs for parties that normally can't do business together, but and these two IRAs are funding at the same time, um, are they in any instance getting present benefiting from each other if, say, uh, you know, they couldn't do the deal without each other in a certain circumstance? Okay, well, of course, you're going deep on this. All right, yeah, so here, here's, the, here's what he's getting at. There's something called, a, 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 believe it or not, the Department of Labor has something to do with IRAs. Isn't that weird? Like, why? But it's because they're, you know, they really, it's more ERISA plans. But DOL ruling 2000-10 says that about investing with yourself. So there's a ruling about this, but I would never invest with myself, my own money and my IRA money, because how do you say you didn't get any personal benefit? Mm -hmm. But if but if if you can't do the deal unless you use your IRA money, then you're getting personal benefit. So 2000-10 kind of fleshes that out, but it's it's I just wouldn't go there. I mean, you, you can invest in so many other things. Right. right, and why, you know, why not sleep at night and not have to worry about that kind of right, thing. Right. So. And, um, and also we talked about, you know, even if it's a just uh, a non-disqualified party, you might have a closely held business partner or something like that you do a lot of business with. Right. Um, or, you know, it's, it's more substance over form, right? So, I mean, if someone is, um, if, if someone is, you know, looks like they're, you know, getting present benefit, you have to explain it to the IRS auditor in that case. And so you better have a strong case so that your entire you know, uh, retirement account doesn't get cashed out for you and right. taxed. So. And again, a lot of people don't get audited real quick. And so it's, it's not like self-directed IRAs are getting audited every five seconds. That's not happening. But you want to be, you want to sleep at night and you want to do it correctly and you want to follow the rules because this is precious money. If you can only put away $5,500 a year into a traditional or, or a Roth or or even if you're putting $5,500 away in a SEP or $55,000 away, away in a SEP, I mean, mm -hmm. it's precious money because it's capped um, and it, it's hard to replace it if it gets lost. Why take chances with that money? Why take risks? Um, I think you just answered it was about investing at the same time, mm -hmm. partially from your IRA and partially from your own. No. So it, it is allowed, but you don't recommend it? Well, because how do you prove that you didn't have personal benefit? 
There, yes, there's this ruling called, again, 2000-10, which you could, but I wouldn't, you know, you want to talk to a lawyer about, about doing that. Mm-hmm. I just wouldn't go there. I mean, why would you, why would you do, why would you take that risk? You have to ask yourself that question. So, yeah. yeah. Yes. So what about on the back end? Let's say that you bought a house in your uh, self-directed account okay. at two hundred thousand dollars, and then you're sixty-eight years old and now it's worth six hundred. What happens at that point? Do Love you it. Sure. Well, when your IRA, when your IRA purchases an asset, it's not to, it's supposed to not be for present or future use. You're, so you're not supposed to have it in mind as a retirement home for later. And how do you prove that? Just keep a journal. You know, like acquisition date, costs. Here's a copy of the ad from advertising it as a rental, and you you can demonstrate your intent to keep it as a rental or as you know all these years. And then now you're 68, and you decide, hey, I want to live in this house. So what you do is you can't buy it from your IRA because you're disallowed, but you go get an appraisal and you withdraw the house from your IRA at its market value, and you get 1099 for that. So you would pay income tax just like if it was cash, and you took that much cash out of your IRA, you get a 1099 and no tax. Same thing if you do the appraisal and take out a non-cash asset like that. And that's why it's really important when you're doing these things to make sure you do the high-yielding deals instead of a Roth or a Roth IRA or something like that so that those, those big taxes don't hit you on the back. Mm. You know, so, question here. Um, my question is about the FD. So, the, the, the Roth IRA, we were talking about the calls upon my nice zero T. Like, what the federal income tax is? A 990T is a, that is the tax return that you file when you're a tax deferred and uh, like a tax free entity. So the IRA would file a 990T if it owes UBIT or UDFI tax. That's that's the, like you and I file a 1040, your IRA would file a 990T if it owed tax. And that tax would be the UBIT or the UDFI tax that we so talked about. So that one would have Schedule E follow, and the Schedule E would be like all the K1. You're a CPA, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. The, the thing here is when you have the retirement fund and in this situation, you investing either in the active, um, active activity or passive. Right. So my understanding here, if you have a passive, like you collect a bunch of income, you do an LLC entity, and then if you an active, you do the S corp. So the S corp and the LLC, LLC chip in the box, C corp, partnership. So the rule will be different for its entity. So my question here is when we have when we do the 99 T schedule E and other pay one flow through, because I assume that you investing in the properties. So you select the entity different for whatever the property that you invested. Mm-hmm. So that's the reason why the, the taxation for the property is different because the entity is different. So, so remember that all the entities you are going to invest in or invest through are flow through entities to the uh, to the IRA in itself, and so uh, that IRA in itself is not taxed unless you have to do the 990T for the actual uh, IRA. In which case, you'll be taxed on the you know the debt finance income tax or the related business income tax. Completely separate. There's no Schedule E or anything like that. This just goes directly to your IRA. So your IRA and you are completely separate entities. You have basically an LLC or an escort or whatever you have uh, the rental income in or whatever investment. It flows right back through to your IRA, and you are completely separated from that on the tax side. If that is a completely separate tax return um, from that perspective, so um, so you don't have those types of issues with um, with that aspect if it flows right through. Now, if you have an S corp or a C corp for some reason, it'll get taxed at that level, and then you know the distribution. You see what happens when CPAs talk to each other? <laughs> yeah. And if the moon is full on a Thursday, then it's like this. <laughs> yes, we love it. It's all unities and, and all that fun stuff. So, um, you know, let's um, uh, let's talk about some of the tax benefits associated with this because okay. I think 
I think you know you said the fifty five hundred dollars you know into a traditional IRA um, you know and that doesn't sound like a lot right it's not it doesn't really do a whole lot for you it gives you some tax benefit associated with the traditional IRA contribution but where I see the real power is is a self directed four hundred one k so most of the time when you work for someone else you have your own four hundred one k and you have to invest it in the assets that they want you to invest in which is usually stocks bonds and mutual funds and things like that right but then when you actually have a, um, a self-directed 401k, you invest in what you want, but the same types of rules apply, where you can do like an $18,000 initial contribution. So this is what I did this year. I did an $18,000 contribution. I did a company matching of 25% of my, of my salary. So like another like $15,000 is what I put in on top of that. And then, so, so I get both of that right into my 401k, all, all tax deferred. Okay, and then on top of that, I put in a health savings account contribution of another six thousand seven fifty. If you're married, um, uh, I put in an IRA contribution. There's a lot of different things you can do. There's even pension plans out there that you can do self-directed pension plans and put in very large amounts of money, like a hundred or thousand dollars or more per year. Plans, yeah. It can be pretty substantial inside your retirement account. So. Don't just think of it as the 5500 If you start a flip business and you're starting to really, really do well and you want to reduce your taxes, you got to look at these structures. You have to look at the 401k structures for the self You do, and let's back up a little bit. I mean, most of us know what a 401k is because we've all had a job and, you know, you, there are 401ks with your employer. So when, when you work for someone else, you have one role employee, and that's one role. And like Matt was saying, if you're under 50, your contribution this year is 18000 you can put in there, you can max out. And um, if you're 50 plus, it's 24. Actually, it's 24,500 now. It's 18,500, 24,500. If you're 50 plus, so there's more. It's a catch-up contribution. That's if you're an employee. But if it's a solo 401k, that means that you have one. It means that you're self-employed. You have no full-time employees in any of the companies you own. So that's that's the litmus test to, to get. That's what you have to pass through to get one of these accounts. So you're self-employed. No full-time employees in any of the companies you own. Now you can do what Matt did. Make your employee contribution, which he contributed 18000 and then make your employer contribution. As Matt said, it was 25% of his income, and it equals fifteen grand. So you had you know, $33,000 uh, contribution. And so knowing you, some of that was Roth, but you probably got a tax deduction on the other part. The employee bucket can be Roth, but the employer bucket is always pre-tax. So if you're... If you're um, Self-employed, you're, you're wearing two hats. When you, you said you have a solo 401k, so you're wearing more than two hats too because when you have a solo 401k, you're the employer, and so you're responsible for the plan and the plan document. You're the employee, so you're a participant, but you're also the trustee of the plan. So it's with, with IRAs, we custody them, we do the tax reporting and record keeping, but 401ks are different. And this may be why you're not pleased with your current servicer because they're not servicing your account. <laughs> you are. I mean, we all, um, you're the trustee of the plan, and so you're responsible for the tax filings. We'll still, we still um, review the accounts. We, we, we uh, custody the funds. We you know, do the record keeping on the, uh, on the funds. And, but then you're the trustee of the plan. You and your CPA are filing. And I, you know, if, if, you need, if you make more than two, 250000 if you file a 5500 easy, I think, or something, and uh, so you the filings that you have to file. So you and your CPA work together and you do those filings when it's a, when it's a solo 401k. And, and how do you, um, I know you've dealt with this before with other people, um, how do you go at the end of the year and know that you have to file your you know, 550 EZ and know you're above that if you own real estate in your account? So you may be under the 250, but then you know, your value of the property now might be higher or something. What, what's the process look like when you're trying to value your account? You know, for me, that process is so simple. I pick up the phone and call my CPA. Done. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but yeah, that's what they do. I mean, that, then they give you tax advice and they crunch the numbers and they tell okay. you. And most yeah. of the time, they, you, know, you want to go and get, a, um, and get an appraisal done or a BPO or some sort of value. Oh, you're talking about annual valuations. That's, annual a, that's, valuation. a good, that's a good topic. It's a topic that the IRS is going to be addressing coming up. I can't wait because they, have, they say almost nothing about it. But um, anyway, so hopefully it'll, it'll all work out great. So here's what happens. When you've got a stock in your IRA and borrowing your phone, you can just pick up your phone and um, you can find out what your stock is worth, right? There's no, no question what it's worth. You, anybody can see it. But when you have 
a, an alternative asset like a house, well, you, you know, you're not really sure what it's worth. What about a note? You know, if someone's going to evaluate a note, they're, they're going to look at the they're going to look at the face amount. They're going to look at how many payments are yet to be received, and then maybe give you a little discount for the marketability of that note and give you a different value. So, so these values can be subjective. So the way it seems to work right now is that if you've got a taxable event, like you're going to do a Roth conversion or you're going to do a withdrawal and, it's, and you're going to get taxed on it, you need a full-on appraisal of that asset. So we and I we know valuators that'll evaluate hard to hard to value assets that are in IRAs, you know, self directed IRAs like notes and like precious metals are easy too because there's a spot price, right? So you know what that is. You know what like silver is thirteen dollars and forty six cents today or something like this, and you know that, so you know the value without really getting a valuator. Um, but yeah, so when it's every year, we're going to ask you for the value of your property or the value of your assets, and then we'll have you tell us the value of your assets, and we're going to report that value on your 5498. But say, for example, you've got uh, an asset, and then you want to tell, and we, we say it's $100,000 on the books, and you, you email us and you say, oh, no, that asset is worthless, just write it off. <laughs> we can't do that <laughs> because we're not valuators. We need we need proof that it's a zero value asset. So you'd need to have a valuation because we can't write down a value without a third party evaluator uh, approving it. That, that that goes back to another part, by the way, is if as how incredibly important it is to do your due diligence before you invest. I, I'm just going to tell a story because stories are good. There's a real estate investor club near us uh, that ran for ten plus years. And they were having people invest in notes. Um, and it turns out that they were, I guess since they've been not sentenced, but um, convicted. They're, they're criminals. They're, okay, <laughs> hashtag criminals. Um, you know, who knew? Uh, certainly not their investors. But uh, since, since that happened and their assets are worthless, they were calling us. that We had 17 accounts involved in this saying, well, uh, you, you know this happened, just write it down to a zero value. And it's like, well, you know, we'd like to, but we can't. So a couple of reasons uh, for, for that, because we're not valuators, but also a lot of times uh, there'll be some value that comes back. So say, for example, you invested in a private placement and that company went bankrupt and then there's zero value. You can see the bankruptcy papers, but they were able to retrieve some value. We've seen people get 80% of their value back, and that can happen too, but you just closed your account where does it go? And that, that creates a problem. It needs to go back in the IRA, but then you don't have an IRA anymore. You just closed it out, wrote down the value to zero. It's going to be taxable to you. So that's kind of going deep on a lot of different I think, things. I think, it's, I think it's important to understand you know, this stuff because you know, there's so many ways that you, know, you could do the wrong thing. You, know, you, could, you could mess up and you could, you could go through and do, do the wrong due diligence on an investment. You could go and do a prohibited party transaction. You know, um, and, and have a big chunk of your IRA, if not all of it, taxable. Then you know, there's there's issues with it that you just need to be educated. But at the same time, if if you're educated about it, it can be one of the best tools you can use. And we don't usually. I'm telling you, like these these things to watch out for. We're telling you about all the exceptions. The rule is that things go just fine. I mean, most of the right, time, we, right. we we don't usually see fraud. We don't usually. See, in fact, we've I, like coming back from the conference. Everyone was unanimous in saying yes. We're seeing less and less fraud. Which is wonderful, you know, because I think it's we're policing it more too, or right. which is to say we're on the lookout. We're kind of we can we we know some of the scams and we can help to avoid them. And in that, that situation she was referring to, um, what was actually happening was there was debt getting piled on top of other loans, on top of other loans with no equity in properties because they were preying on new investors that didn't oh. understand the paperwork involved and didn't understand the collateral and the, to check the title to make sure there's no other liens on the property. Or check to make sure that their note got recorded so, after they right, invested. Exactly. And so those yeah. types of things are really important to make sure that you get the recorded documents and make sure you have the reporting numbers. These are the things with the due diligence on an investment where people get in trouble. Um, and that's where your experience as a real estate investor is really important to keep that knowledge base up when it comes to whatever you're investing in, whether it's syndications, you know, understanding are they leveraging, are they not leveraging, what are the rules in those syndication documents, if it's a property, making sure you understand all the property aspects and know what it's going to cost you on the notes, making sure you understand the paperwork and who you're lending to and what the collateral piece is. It's doing those specific things. To, that will solve 90% of your problems right there. It's doing the right homework on your on your assets and the investments that you're investing in. And if you don't know, if you're not sure about this type of thing, 
there's plenty of advisors that can actually go do this for you and can actually go through and, and show you and teach you. This is how you do the due diligence. That's so true. Didn't the gentleman in the back say he was done spending money learning? Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know? So you spend you know, 20 bucks and you come to a Phoebe meeting and you learn so much. And it's not just from Matt or me, but it's from the people in the room because everybody's got a story to tell and everybody you know, has got an experience that they can share with you about how they did something. And say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Have you ever done this? When you're networking, yeah, I did that. Well, you know, what do you look for? And and people can help you. That's this is such an amazing community we have, really all over the country. But I know this, you know, since I'm here in Southern California, so what a community! Like you Facebook friend everybody, and then you've got a property in Long Beach that you're working on, and and suddenly you need a plumber. You're like ah, Facebook, I need a plumber in Long Beach. Who knows what you know somebody? And then there's a community of people. Are you you call Matt? Hey Matt, do you know a you know pr- plumber in Long Beach? And and They'll, they'll help you find some. You know, you need it. It takes a, it takes a tribe here, I, I believe, with investing. That's, but you get a great you get great advice from being in a place. Hey, that's what's great about these meetings. It's like mm-hmm. I meet new people with resources and stuff all the time. That's why we do this. That's why you know I'm here every month since 2008, just meeting people, and, and yeah. it's been cool. You know, everybody that I do business with, or 90 percent of them, I've met at these different groups, and yeah. the, the power of networking is huge. You know, when I first got started, I was going to four networking events a week, every week, to go raise capital and invest and find investors and find resources and different, you know, um, service providers and things like that that could that could help you in your business. And you know, some people have property, some people have money, some people have you know resources and tools and things like that. Time. Some people have time. That's one of the most important things in the world. So, well, when you when you've got a self directed IRA investment and and you want you want to talk about it, that's when you call us. Hey, I, there's this deal and it looks pretty good, and so we want to talk to you about it. Well, tell us about the deal. You know, what what are you doing? Who is who are the parties involved? Um, you know, what does it look like? And say, for example, it's like, well, this I'm going to make this note to my uncle at one um, percent. It's like, uh, okay, well, 1%, you know, your IRA, it needs to be an investment that looks like favorable treatment. You probably want to rethink that and offer more of a market rate so that it doesn't look like you're giving your uncle like a special family and friends deal that, or that he's getting, you know, preferential treatment. It has to be truly an investment in your IRA. So we're going to talk to you about things like that or, like, again, like you're buying the house next door. That's, that's something to talk about. Are you going to get personal benefit? So t- if you want to know what does this look like in a self-directed IRA, we want to have that conversation with you. And we do that every day. People come up with, like, like you, with the most creative ideas, you know, like, like oh, because you know you can do things with your own money. Just like, I can, I'm, when you talk about, like, like notes, I can just picture, like, Jack Shea. Do anybody know Jack Shea? He's kind of one of the older gurus. He's a great guy. He, he, he's the guy. He'll be in the bar and napkin notes. Okay. Boom, done, let's go do this deal. And that's fine with your money, but when it's self-directed IRA money, it's different. Yeah, right. And you know, we talked about the present benefit that someone else that you get from your IRA, but there's also the other way where your IRA can get present benefit from you. Like for example, you know, oh, right. like doing labor, like yeah, over contribution of sweat yeah. equity, right. right? So you're not allowed to swing the hammers, you're not allowed to uh, mow the lawn in your IRA owned house. Yeah, and you you know, you paint the walls. Just keep it arm's length, all that, all that. And so here's an example of, 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 you're not allowed to provide goods, services, or facilities to the plan. That's what it says. So we saw somebody who was, IRA was buying a house here in California. So it's got the car form. What is this, like an encyclopedia now? It's just like so thick. So we're going through it, right? And we're going through it, looking at it, and it's like the title correctly, looks good, looks good, looks good. Finally get to the back page, and we see, guess who the broker of record is? It's his dad. So not only, so his dad is a disallowed person offering the service of being the, the broker, the, the, sale, the selling broker, offering this service to the plan. He can't do that. But not only did the dad want to offer the service for free, which is disallowed, he wanted a commission too. That would be a disallowed person getting personal benefit. So two strikes against that deal. They had to rewrite the deal. Uh, so that it wasn't, uh, so that there wasn't a disallowed person offering services to the plan. And that, that's key, especially for rental properties too. Like I own a management company, I can't have my management company manage my properties. I have to have an outside management company do that. And so it's mm. the same type of thing. Like I would be just because I own the company, I would be providing personal services to my own IRA if it's managing that asset and getting a fee for doing that. So I have to have an outside company doing that speak piece. It's really interesting when that happens. And so, but let's let, let me. I'm going to switch gears real quick, and I want to talk about custodians and uh, trust companies. Okay. Can you tell me what? 
specifically the custodian does in a self-directed IRA and specifically what the administrator does in a self-directed IRA? This is an interesting question. And for, I mentioned I'm on the board of directors at Rita, and so I represent the um, administrators. But the truth of it is, if you have a self-directed IRA, whether you go through a facilitator, an administrator, or directly to a custodian, you're getting the same deal. You're always going through a custodian. Always. But there's always a custodian on the back end of, it, of the deal. So a custodian... Be, with, with an administrator or a facilitator, you've got somebody that their only job is customer service, is helping you with your self-directed IRA. That's their job. That's our job. That's what we do. But with the custodian, they've got additional responsibilities. For example, cash management duties. Um, that would include things like getting audited, doing internal audits, external audits, um, cash management, making sure that they're, that the, they're investing the idle cash correctly, regulatory you know, audits, um, you know, things like that. So, so their, their attention is, is divided, one arm of customer service doing all this, but then their attention is diverted over here to running the business of running a trust company. Which, which is involves all these other intricate things. Maybe even, you know, there could be uh, litigation and things like this that they're involved in. So, um, so a, tr a trust company or a, a, or a you know custodian bank could be a custodian as well. Um, their attention is going to be divided. So, with an administrator or facilitator, you're dealing with somebody they're just offering you customer service. And I think that's really really important because on the administrator side, there's there. The services are all across the board, and the quality is all across the board from what I've seen. There's the real big ones out there like InTrust and Equity Trust that, um, that I think are, are decent companies. They have a different fee structure. They have different administration, administrative uh, structures, and you know you, you have to be careful about the big companies and getting lost in the shuffle and things like that. One of the things I like about Udirect is the fact that they, there's a low admin fee, and their administrative function is top quality. They have the right people on the ground there. They can actually come in and... and Move that, move that investment through. If you're trying to close on a house really quickly or an investment very quickly, which is usually what happens on really good deals, you need someone that is reliable on that back end. It isn't going to take you know a long period of time to get that thing funded. And you know a lot of times there's totally different fee structures where it can be on asset value, it can be on uh, how many assets you have in that account versus like a flat fee. And some of those other bigger accounts, the more the higher your your value goes, the higher the top. The sliding cost scale. As well, yeah. it's a sliding scale up and that's a big negative in my eyes you know and you're like why am I getting penalized to have more money with you you know it's kind of interesting so can you talk about some of the differences and some of the different fees that are happening inside of a normal IRA sure we've got a whole comparison of all the self-directed IRA companies and their different fee structures and you're right some will some will charge you a flat fee but then if it's real estate it's you know, so so much per year on top of that, that they have that, or it could be the more your account's worth, the more uh, that you pay. But ours is a flat fee, regardless of the number of assets and regardless of their value. So and most everybody has a setup fee to open the account. Ours is fifty dollars. That's an industry standard. Two seventy five years our annual fee, um, and then um, we ask that you leave three hundred twenty five dollars in the account. I have some brochures if you want to see uh, for yourself or take that home in writing. We've got that, but that that's what we charge. So and I think what's also what's great about what I think great about my company, what makes this different is my background is real estate. Like I mentioned, you know, property management. I was a realtor. I was a, in mortgage loan servicing, mortgage loan origination. So I understand deals. I understand how they need to be done and quickly. And, and, so, and a lot of times, like, for example, today there was a question about a deal, and it was my background in mortgage that was able to be the log breaker or the you know, log jam breaker here for this deal and get it moving forward. Because it's like, no, 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 if you're doing this, you do it like this, you know, and and that kind of that's those are the people that I hire people with mortgage and and uh, and real estate experience so that they understand what you're doing because 95 percent of the assets we see are real estate related, you know. And and I think I think it's important to have uh, you know really good custodians and administrators. I mean, there's been companies that I won't name names. Uh, the previous companies are no longer in business, but um, they they went through and they commingled funds. And they got in trouble doing that, and they, they you know, um, had problems with that, and they, they, you know, I don't know if they went to jail or not, I can't remember if they did or not. I know they got convicted, um, so, so I, I okay. they, they had, and then they did something else stupid on top of that, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, there's, there's, you know, and, and, and in the beginning, this, it seemed like, I mean, it's been around for 30 years, but it seemed like some of these facilities 43, yeah. were just starting up and, and things like that. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because you want to know that your funds are safe, and, and yeah. you know, we put that out on there, so... 
this company that he's talking about that'll go nameless <laughs> was what's called a delegated administrator. So we're an administrator. We title the assets in the name of our custodian. So it's not you direct for the benefit of your IRA. It's our custodian for the benefit of your IRA. We're not an administ We're an administrator. We don't have the right to custody assets. But some uh, administrators would be delegated administrators. So they say, hey, trust company, the trust company gives you, delegates their authority to you and lets you do this. So that was a delegated, uh, and so all the money came to the administrator. We don't handle your money. Only the uh, regulated and licensed trust company handles the money with us. With us, the people that handle your money are bonded and insured against theft and fraud. But that company that got into trouble, they were like an unregulated trust company being delegated the way they were. And so we, there have been a couple examples of that delegated trust company situation being abused. And so it's it's being it's it's phasing out in our industry uh, as gradually more and more that's very at, at Rita we frown on that structure. Okay. Um, so it's it's phasing out. And, and you mentioned you just got back from Washington at this at this uh, you know update meeting. Yeah. And I'd love to understand what are some of the things you see coming down the pipe with the industry? What are some of the changes you see happening, some regulatory changes or anything like that? You see any major issues on the horizon? A couple of things. One of the things we were concerned about for a long time is the Department of Labor's um, fiduciary rule. And uh, that was a big thing where they were changing the rules, but then we, uh, they decided that because we're not giving advice, we're not fiduciaries, but those were all Democrats, and then Trump came into office, and boom, now it's kind of off the table. It's most, for the most part, off the table, but then the House might flip, we might have, and then it might come back. So we, we, it, we, we never know. We just have to you know, watch the bouncing ball, see where it goes. Um, but one of the, I'd say probably the hottest topic right now is cryptocurrency. Anybody curious about cryptocurrency? Right, how many of you have a, have a crypto wallet? like Coinbase or, or what's the other one, a Kraken or something like that, right? So have you watched that documentary on Netflix, a Bitcoin documentary? Because I, I, it, it showed up on Netflix one day, and I, and I watched it, and then I watched it again. You know, I've never done that. Like, immediately, I, I need to know this. Such a good documentary. It talks about how, what is Bitcoin, what is blockchain technology, who started this. They kind of don't know. Uh, you know, the person's kind of a secret person. And, and where is it going? What is it? And it's, it's early days with this cryptocurrency. So can you, your IRA invest in cryptocurrency? The answer is yes. So at the conference, it was so interesting at this point, all these trust companies, we're, we're, we're friendly with one another. At first, everybody kept their cards close to the chest until we realized we all have the exact same problem and it's not a competitive issue. So with, uh, with cryptocurrency, you can have a device called, a cold, called cold storage and you can custody cryptocurrency as a custodian. But there are so many things that there are these passwords um, and, and like a whole bunch of a chain, I think it's called a seed, a whole chain of words that, that it belongs to you, and then another chain of numbers that belongs to you. If they get one digit off, your cryptocurrency could be lost forever. So the, 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 what we, the consensus was that the risk for a self-directed IRA custodian to custody cryptocurrency personally was too great as a company to take on that risk. And who would insure it? No one. Because yeah, you can have it on a hard drive, basically, right? A secondary hard drive. Right. That, that's correct. That's the, that's a cold storage. And in fact, one of the guys said that he had one. He went ahead and bought one because he thought, you know, this is the new thing. He wanted to be up on top of things. And he said, I can't do this. I wouldn't sleep at night. What if, what if something was one, one, we're human beings. We make mistakes. There's one guy that had one of these cold storage units and he realizes it has $800 million of cryptocurrency on it. And he's digging up a, a, a dump you're looking for this because because it's so valuable. How'd you like to, that to be you? So there's there's a lot of risk and it's early days on what this is. So what we say and what the industry is is saying is that have your IRA invest in IRA own LLC. The LLC opens the wallet. You as the manager would open the wallet in the name of the LLC, the IRA owned LLC, and then you're making those decisions. So if there's a mistake, you've made it because we don't want to be the ones making that mistake because we typed a, a two instead of a three yeah. or something like Big that. Risk. And right. I think, I think there's going to be a lot of changes with new investments and technology that comes out and things like that. I mean, things are changing so drastically right now. It's going to be a difficult thing in the industry to say, yeah. how do we, you know, what's our liability as a custodian and an administrator? We're always looking at fraud. You're right. And, and so a couple of years ago, or actually for the last uh, several years, maybe five years, the big thing is, oh, crowdfunding and what's, what's this? It's a portal and the Jobs Act. And so we have this regulatory panel. There's somebody from the SEC. FINRA, NASA, and the FBI on this panel. I mean, like, 
very people with a lot of responsibility. And they're telling us, they start talking about, about crowdfunding, and they called it quaint. That it wasn't what we thought it was going to be. It's a disappointment. It, it just didn't come out like we thought. But when they use the word quaint to describe crowdfunding, what crowdfunding really is, is not new. It, it started a long time ago when they came up with the Reg D offering. What is it? Um, the Howie test? From, it was in Orange County with orange trees or something that started. Anyway, that started like what is a syndication and all this. So when you, if you're raising other people's money, you go to your attorney um, and you, you can have, you can file a Reg a, B, C, or D offering. A, B, C, and D have different rules on how you can advertise, how, how much money you can collect, and so forth. But if you're going to gather other people's money, um, that's, that's what you're using. And really, crowdfunding is just using one of these, one of these vehicles through a, through a portal. Now, notes um, also can be a security. So uh, that's another thing, too, just to throw this out there. We we're talking about the regulatory panel. That, that with notes, um, you want to see that uh, is this is it is it a security? Is this note a security? If it is, is the note offer uh, registered with the SEC, and is the deal registered with the SEC? Part of your due diligence when you're looking at these things. So again, this is when you want to you want to you know dig deep and do your research. Okay, thank you. And, uh, anything else you can think of off the, off that's happening right now? I, I, I know it's a tough one. Yeah. Well, it's 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 never that dramatic, which is great. And right now, there's so many other things going on in Washington, like. Like, I think they're hiring new people every day is what I read, right? Because everybody keeps changing jobs. Um, so they're not really focused on IRAs intensely right now. Um, it's funny how we know that Trump likes to tweet. Well, one of the most powerful things he ever did was tweet for our industry. And he said, look, we're leaving your 401k alone when they were coming up with the, with the, with the tax, new tax laws. Because there was something that we were afraid of, something called Rothification, that everything was going to have to be a Roth. And there was some threat about this. And then Trump said, look, it works. This was a tweet. It works. We're leaving it alone. We're not touching your 401k. And he just left retirement alone, and which think, is great. There was a new fiduciary rule that we talked that, uh, um, that we uh, just touched on, but um, uh, specifically with regard to if you're raising capital from a self-directed retirement account, that if you're using that money for your investment, that you could be a fiduciary um, of the IRA funds, meaning if you lost it, you'd be responsible for the, that money. Is that the case? Have you seen that come around? or what's? The... I, I haven't seen this, but this is why you want to talk to a syndication attorney. We have a couple great ones in California, like uh, Trowbridge and Sedoti. You know, Gene Trowbridge and Jillian Sedoti are, are great uh, local resources for crowd. They're, in fact, their company's crowdfunding lawyers, you know, and right, I think that's their, their, their uh, website. So we've got a lot of, and I'm sure, you know, you know them, you'll see them at clubs, you'll see, you know, if you want to uh, hear them speak, you can learn more about that. But there, you've got so many resources for this sort of thing. If you want to raise capital, and which I'd like to talk about for a second too, raising capital. So self-directed IRAs, it's not just for your retirement, because man, we all need to save for retirement like crazy. It's Retirement's coming at you like a freight train. Do you have like a niece or a nephew? Like her niece is 13 and her niece was just born. Yeah. And she's 13. How did that happen? Well, that's how you're going to feel about your retirement. So whatever you do, I mean, and when you leave tonight, just go do yourself a favor. Make a contribution to your some retirement account. Just do it for yourself. Pay yourself, not the IRS. Number one, save some money. And then if you're going to invest it, do your due diligence. That's incredibly important. Get the advice of experts. Uh, incredibly important. But what's happening on the... You know, on the on the national level, we're looking at state laws, and there's a state law uh, in Ohio that we're looking at. And so, Rita Axe is a lobbyist. When there, when laws are about to be enacted that can affect our industry, we just wrote a a, um, a, a paper uh, to uh, the state of Ohio. They're about to make this decision. Hey, consider these things before you make your decision. And so, we work as a lobby to. Um, because people don't understand self-directed IRAs right. and they make rules. We wouldn't. Need, I don't think we'd be an industry if it wasn't for this uh, reader group. But, but I thought all politicians are extremely intelligent about tax law. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> all politicians <laughs> so, are so, experts. Okay, this is awesome information. At so tax. How, if someone wants to learn a little bit more about self-directed IRAs, where, where can they start? Can they go to your website and read about sure. it? Sure. Find different information about a tremendous it. amount of information on our website. Um, you can email me. I can send you links to some videos. I have a video with 57,000 hits. <laughs> you know, it just covers the basics. You know, how to open an account, and it just really goes through the basics. I'd be happy to send you uh, that information. But if you've got a specific deal you want to talk about, just call us. You know, I've got a staff, and we can, we'd be happy to talk to you about your specific deal. 
So if anybody has a question, I'd like to that as well. I'll quite yeah. Much, if you guys need help with just the general understanding of that, I help clients do that all the time, and I'll charge for that kind of stuff. So if you have a basic question or just need some help, let me know what's up, and I'll help you guys out. Question over here, sir. I want to say two questions. <clears throat> One is self-directed IRA versus 401 solo. 401ks. Okay. And second one is having a either one of those invest in a PPM. Because what our company does is we invest in properties as a group. Yeah. And we put out a PPM. So, I'm so your first question is, do I want an IRA or do I want to sell a 401k? That's So what you want to do is, before you self-direct, develop a plan. What are you going to do? What's your plan? And you develop that plan with your advisors, with your real estate advisors, your tax advisors. You know, how much do you make? Maybe you make you know 60000 Maybe you make 600 thousand maybe you make 60 million i don't know but you've got a tax structure right and so what fits your tax structure so that's how you decide do i want to or maybe are you self-employed are you an employee are you retired or what are you doing because in order to contribute you have to have active income to contribute to a plan so there are a lot of different things so you start with your plan what do you want to do and everything is based on that plan like how do you execute your plan it's not so much for us as it is for we're trying to take this information back to other potential investors. Right. Well, you're not going to give them tax advice either. Right. No. Right. I just want to let them yeah. find out if they were to have one. Yeah. How would that work investing in our PPM? Well, so it's, right. So, so here's the takeaway. When you, if you, this is a takeaway from tonight. Something to write down. If you are raising capital, ask, these are the. This is a question to ask. Do you have an IRA or do you have a 401k with a previous employer? If they say yes you'll be the hero because they won't even know that money could be invested in your deal. They won't even know that. And you'll tell them and they'll say, no, an IRA can only invest in the stock market. What are you talking about? An IRA can't buy a house. We have CPAs tell their clients an IRA can't buy a house, but they yeah, kind of can. So if you just say, yeah, I know, do you have an IRA or do you have a 401k with a previous employer? The answer is yes, they can invest in your deal. So you're not, so an advisor can tell you what you should or shouldn't do. But and, but but if you're not an advisor, then you can, you can tell them what they're. But they have to be separated from their employer. They can. They can roll over. Right. They, if they're separated. Plan. But yeah. if they're currently employed, they can't utilize that. That's advice. a great point. So, That's an excellent point. So if you're if you're presently employed, and you're thinking, wow, the self-directed IRA thing sounds really great. And by the way, it's not. We just say IRA because like it's a blanket statement, but it's a it's a traditional, a Roth, a SEP, a simple, a spousal, an inherited IRA. A solo 401k, it can be an ESA or an HSA. All those things can be self-directed. And now what was I saying? Uh, <laughs> if you sorry, if you're employee. Employee. Okay. I, I think it's important definitely to understand the structure first because in reality, like, you know, you can have all of them. Like, it, it's, it's really cool when you start doing the tax strategy stuff and you start saving money, you know? Yeah. You know. But if you've got, so maybe somebody wants to invest with you and they say, oh my God, that's great because I'm working at Boeing and I have this half million in my 401k. I want to invest with you. Well, what you want to tell them to do is this. You don't just tell them no, because it's not always no. What they want to do is go to their plan administrator and ask for what's called an in-service transfer, because they're still working there, they're in-service, but they might be eligible for an in-service transfer. Sometimes you can get one if you're over 59 and a half, or maybe you worked at company A that was bought by company B, and the money that you saved at company A can be transferred in while you're still in service. So there can be exceptions. And it's not a law or a rule. It's it's a contractual thing in your plan, in the company's plan document. That's where that's right. And if you want to read the plan document and not rely on your HR person to tell you, because most of the HR people don't understand this at all. If you're Matt Owens, you read the plan document. Yeah. <laughs> or you can quit your job. Yeah, you could quit your job too. Yeah, <laughs> like like you back here, you can quit your job. I need no. to explain it to my wife and let her fall asleep. She actually told me the other day, oh, I'm really interested when you talked about real estate, but for some reason I just want to fall asleep. <laughs> well, it's detail oriented. Unless you're, in, you know, if, if you're in the moment, um, and, but if you're thinking about, hey, look, I've, I've got this, I've got this plan. So start with the plan, and how do I get from point A to point B? These are fascinating facts because it's going to move you further down the ladder to achieving your goal. But if you don't have a goal, then it doesn't. You can't. You know, it doesn't apply to you. So have goals and have plans. And that's that's really important. I mean, really, yeah. with that goal in mind, most financial planners will say, build your retirement to here, so that it'll last you until you die, mm-hmm. and then you die broke. You know, um, that's that's been the mentality, right? It's like keep building and building because they can't create a cash flow stream that's big enough for you to retire off of. They don't. Those assets that typically you invest in, unless it's way up here, are not going to produce that kind of cash flow. 
And so, you know, it's interesting when you start to learn these strategies. The reason my learning is like always, you know, trying to learn as much as I can is I know financial education is the key to financial freedom. And so if you can actually do that and build your retirement account to where it produces enough cash flow to where you're using that to retire and never depleting the principal and having more coming out or coming in so you can reinvest that money to keep up with inflation on top of that, you are truly financially free at that point. That's really the goal. That's what got me quitting my CPA firm job to go into real estate full time and learn this stuff. It's because you realize, stop trading your time for your money. What are you all here working for? You want to work towards building assets that create the income without you having to work for it long term. And every one of these little facts is like a building block toward that goal. Right, right. And that's huge. I mean, when you start to learn, like if you're making two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, if you start saving fifty, sixty thousand dollars in tax a year for proper tax planning, you're going whoa. That is a big deal. Really that. powerful. It's compounding yeah. your growth at that point. So, absolutely important. So, everybody, give Carter a yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Say again? Thank you. Can you give them your website? One sure. More it's the letter U, udirectira.com. Uh, if you want to email us, it's info at udirectira.com. And we're happy to talk to you or you know, email with you, whatever, and, and answer all your questions. So, Perfect. there we go. Thank you, Carter. Thank you. Appreciate it. Network, everybody. Okay.